galaxies or a class of high redshift, far infrared luminous galaxies uh, that are predominantly discovered in the Southern Unique Wayband. Um, I will tell you some of the things we tried to learn about them uh, before we got off ALMA came along, and then I will show you what we've learned subsequent from ALMA about this class of sources. Um, you know, this used to be a very simple talk to give, it was a nice linear story. Uh, in the last couple of years, with the number of ALMA programs, things have got a bit more complicated, so I've had to pick and mix some of the results to, to show you here. Uh, but hopefully it will give you a taste uh, of the class of uh, what properties of this class of objects are. Um, so I should highlight my collaborators, of which Fagan is one of them. Uh, I specifically, Stuart Stack and James Simpson, who are two graduate students, or James has actually uh, recently graduated, uh, who did a lot of the work that I'm going to be showing here. This movie that's been looping uh, is, uh, it illustrates one of the problems uh, that we had before ALMA, uh, which is this is an image of a submillimeter source taken with a single dish telescope, uh, very low resolution, it's <coughs> about half an arc minute across, uh, and as you'll see, this was a, a real challenge to try to identify the source of emission responsible for that large blob, uh, and this morphs into an ALMA map uh, taken at 870 microns in submillimeter uh, that allows you, because of the very much finer beam of ALMA interferometer, uh, allows you to pinpoint precisely uh, the location of that submillimeter galaxy. Uh, so. Right, so this is an outline of the talk. Um, you get to see this as we go through, and you'll be glad to see the like, grey out material as we get on, so you'll know when I'm going to be finished. Uh, I'll start with a few slides introducing uh, the background why the far infrared and submillimeter is an important field to study if you're interested in galaxy formation, galaxy evolution. I'll give you a couple of slides on uh, the first surveys uh, and the large scale surveys that we've been doing from the ground to try to, uh, to identify samples of, of this class of objects. And then we'll get into the meat of the, the talk, which is uh, what you can do when you have an interferometer a billion. 1.3 billion euro interferometer uh, if you, uh, and to study this class of objects. And so we'll go through a bunch of relatively recent results that have come out in the last couple of years. I'll give you a slide or two that tries to link these high range sources to populations today. Um, I should say this is an almost entirely speculative, so you, you are allowed to laugh at this point. Uh, and then we'll go through the conclusions. So, okay. So, when I started in this field many moons ago, 20 years ago, um, the picture on the left of here, um, what, well, didn't exist, but the equivalent of the picture image, which was the Hubble Deep Field, um, was held up as the, the crown and glory of galaxy evolution studies. Okay? It was a optical, very deep optical UV image taken with Hubble Space Telescope. This is an updated version of even deeper Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, and the idea was that you could use uh, the, the galaxies that you see in here, you could use their ultraviolet brightness and the luminosities to infer their star formation rates, you could use their colours to try to infer their redshifts, and you could make a plot like this one over here, which is redshift versus star formation rate and density in the universe. Uh, so this basically is looking back in time, you see that as you look back in time, the amount of stars being formed in the universe increases. Increases very rapidly, out to about redshift of two, and then you know, claim, the claims are recently that it might decline uh, at higher redshifts. And in the late 90s, the early 2000s, you know, this was the answer. We knew the answer. We knew the way the galaxies evolved. Um, you know, they, this you could learn everything from taking a Hubble image uh, and and doing this sort of analysis. Now there was a hint um, even back then mid-90s that that was probably not the case and that's uh, summarised in this plot. This is a plot of the, the backgrounds, the cosmological backgrounds from the optical and UV, and confusingly this is reverse, it's in frequency space, so this is the optical waveband over here, one micron, here we're out in the far infrared and into the millimetre waveband. And this is a summary of all the measurements of the background, this is the Effectively, intensity versus wavelength, 
And what you can see is there's an awful lot of emission going out in the ultraviolet and optical wavelength. This is what you can see in that Hubble Space Telescope image. You know, this is direct emission from the photospheres of stars and from AGN. But then there's an equally large bump over here at the far infrared and the sub millimeter wavelength. And the fact that these two these two bumps are roughly comparable in terms of their intensity tells you that there's a lot of photons um, that are being reprocessed. So what you're seeing over here, this far infrared emission, is dust grains in galaxies or around AGM that are being heated by, by UV photons. They are emitting that heat, they're radiating that heat in far infrared, as far infrared photons, and that's being redshifted into far infrared and eventually into the submillimeter if these sources are at high enough redshifts. So this plot, this figure tells you, you know, about half of the stars or half of the star formation that happened in the universe was probably hidden from our view, and the other half is what you can see in the Hubble Space Telescope image. And this figure <coughs> uh, sort of brings that home. So here we're back to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field again, but here I have one of these submillimeter images taken with a Lobo telescope. Uh, um, down in, in, on the uh, well, both the cameras are on the Apex telescope in the Atacama, um, and you can see that there are thousands of sources in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, there's one source in this Lobo image of that region of the sky. I always have to remember that you know, some millimeter maps you can always forget whether white is flux or black is flux, but honestly, <laughs> that is the one source that we have. Um, it sits off in a fairly unprepossessing part of this image. Um, now the important thing from the perspective of this talk is that if you add up all the star formation in all of these galaxies, you, know, you get an, uh, an amount that's somewhere up here. If you add up the star formation that's going on in this single source, you're within about a factor of two of everything that you can see in DUV. Okay, so this single source, because it's so luminous, it's forming so many stars, it's producing nearly as many stars as the rest of the galaxy as you can see in this image. And so this was where it became clear that we really did need to understand this class of objects if we wanted to reconstruct a, a, a robust measure of the star formation history of the universe. So another background slide. If you had to ask, you know, I, I, got a, I found some far infrared sources at high redshift, what is the local analog? What is the thing that I can study locally that will tell me most about what their properties are likely to be? There's a class of objects that uh, they have horrible acronyms, I'm sorry, but ULURGS is, is what this one is. So this is ultraluminous infrared galaxies. And they're ultraluminous because they're more luminous than luminous infrared galaxies. And then there's a class of objects that are called hyperluminous galaxies, infrared galaxies, and then surprisingly they're brighter than even the ultraluminous ones. So these objects, we find them in very small numbers in the local universe. This is an example of uh, one that's just about on the universe level. Uh, here's an optical image of this. Here's a Herschel far infrared image. And what you see is that there is intense star formation going on in this system that is basically hidden behind this dust that you, ca you can't see in the optical image. It's shrouded in the background star formation. And as a result of this dust, most of the emission from these objects comes out in the far infrared. And this is a plot of an average spectrum, spectrum energy distribution for a star forming spiral galaxy in blue, and one of these ultra luminous, very dusty galaxies, which has a much more intense emission in the far infrared. Most of the power, most of the star formation in these systems is obscured by the dust. It only comes out in the far infrared. So, you do not see very much uh, in terms of the ultraviolet and optical emission compared to um, the strength or the level of activity in the system. Now, the worrying thing from looking at this local population is that actually these, this class of objects is negligible. At the present day, most stars that are being formed in galaxies are being formed in things that are like the Milky Way or you know, comparable and a, a little less massive. This class of very extreme high star formation objects produces less than 1% of the total star formation rate density at the present day. So you could quite happily ignore them, you would think, if you were using the local universe as a 
that's uh, an example of, um, you know, of one of the problem. Situation is at high ratios. However, we know from the far infrared background, the plot I showed you earlier, the cosmological background, that there has to be a lot of emission, that, uh, you know, there is a lot of emission coming out of the far infrared, and that means that this class of objects has to evolve very rapidly. And so this plot is a cartoon, um, I thought it was probably a group from Matthew Bethlehem, but it's effectively it's a cartoon. It's an attempt to um, model the, the intensity of the far infrared background using simple evolutionary models and applying them to local galaxy models. And what you see is that there is very strong evolution. This is the luminosity coming out of different classes of sources as a function of redshift. So the ULURGS is very high star formation rates, objects ones with star formation rates over about 100 solar masses a year, evolve very rapidly. The luminous infrared galaxies, which are slightly less active, they have star formation rates that are typically about 10 solar masses a year. They also are evolve rapidly, but they seem to, in this model, they seem to, to, uh, to turn over their activity peaks about redshift 1. And in fact, at high redshifts, at least in this model, it's the ULERGs that are expected to dominate. They, they produce about half the stars that are being formed at very high redshifts, around redshift 2, are being formed in this class of, of, uh, of objects. Now, the fact is, I've shown you, you know, this is a, I call this a cartoon, which I think is probably a fair explanation of it. Um, the fact that you're, we're driven to making cartoons tells you that the state of knowledge in this field was rather rudimentary uh, before Alma came along. So, uh, as a result, there's been, it's been a, an absolute godsend to the theorists um, who, in the absence of any evidence, have been able to come up with a whole host of wonderful different mechanisms for explaining what this class of these class of high redshift sources might be. Um, yeah. Yes? So neither Spitzer nor Herschel did much to listen that comparison. Is that what you find? Yes, so so Spitzer uh, Spitzer's far infrared capabilities unfortunately were not very great. Uh, and Herschel, because of the small ditch, um, is really limited to looking out to about redshift or maybe a bit above. You know, it, effectively, you hit the confusion limit it, because of the small, the three and a half meter primary mirror. You cannot find very high redshift statistical samples of high redshift sources, apart from the lens example. So Herschel's done a great deal of stuff with lens sources, but in terms of trying to find, doing a survey at redshift two, let's say, uh, you are only able to see the most extreme examples. But Actually, colored part of the lines is supported by data. Yes, by data. yeah. No, so this is this is based on number counts, Herschel number counts, not not spits of the mostly Herschel number counts in the background. This is what Matthew was trying to fit. So it's you know at some point it becomes an extrapolation over here, which is why I I added a question mark by the way. This version has you know, has those lines you can just make out, um, but I don't personally don't feel that they're really uh, really supportable at the level with the existing observations, but we'll get to that. So, back to um, the theoretical interpretation of these high redshift, highly star forming objects. Um, there have been a whole bunch of different proposals for, for what they might be. Um, locally, this class of ULERGs, this horrible acronym, are, are mostly found to be mergers. They're when one galaxy runs into another one, you get, you get the gas in those systems. Concentrating in the central regions of the joint potential well, you can get very high gas densities, very high star formation rates, big bursts of star formation. So this is not a completely nuts popular proposal. Unfortunately, they broke, they then broke the rule of it not being nuts by, by messing with the initial mass function in their model to try to tweak it, and so this is not quite as mainstream as you might hope. Um, even with perhaps less mainstream, I guess, is uh, Desco has come up with this very attractive model, makes very pretty pictures, um, that uh, describes these strong star forming events as, based, as something that looks like a, a rain of galaxies coming down into a, a, a dark matter potential well at high redshifts. And each of these brings in gas, uh, and you get enough of them raining down, 
and you will get these, these very high star formation rates uh, occurring. So that's another possibility. And then we have a, 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 more, a slightly, I don't know whether this is more left field proposal, which is that actually some of these class of objects might just be what could be described as normal star forming galaxies at high redshift. Very, very gas rich disks. Um, on the limits of stability, and this is my problem with this model, is that to get it to work, you have to make a gas disk that is just, just stable, pouring 10 to the 11 solar masses of gas into it, uh, and then miraculously it becomes unstable, and therefore you get a big burst of star formation. Um, so this is very, requires very fine tuning. Uh, well, uh, uh, as you see, none of these models, uh, I think, have, uh, are, are without criticism. Um, but the nice thing about having so many different competing theoretical models to choose from is it's very easy to write telescope proposals because you just say you want to test this one versus this one, or this one versus that one, or that one versus that one. So uh, it does, it, it, there are some advantages to having a theoretical interest in the field. Nearly done on the introduction. So this is the last key thing. The reason people were very excited about sun millimeters as a way of studying uh, galaxy evolution is the rather odd behaviour that you get because of the shape of this dust spectral energy distribution. So here we have a plot of a typical dusty star-forming galaxy spectral energy distribution, flux versus wavelength. And what's happening here is that this source is being shifted out. It's got constant luminosity, constant star formation rate, but it's being shifted out in redshift artificially. And what you see is if you are observing it in a wave band around one millimeter, your pass band as you, you shift this out, the K correction shifts you up this, this very steep <coughs> dust spectrum. And so over here you have the apparent flux that your telescope can measure as a function of redshift from this source. And what you see is it declines rapidly to about a redshift of a half, but after that, this steep spectrum kicks in and it basically flattens out. Okay, so if you can, this is telling you, if I can survey the universe to, this is, is in millijanskis, is the, the flux unit, if I could survey the universe to a few millijanski sensitivity, take a picture of the sky, then I would see every one of these sources, one of these u lobes, between that was in my patch of sky between redshift one and redshift seven, all at once. The universe that I would see everything in that box, that volume, would be visible to. Okay, it's not the same behaviour that you get in the optical and near infrared, where if you want to see further, you have to integrate deeper. Here, you get effectively a luminosity limited sample at one shot. So this was the great hope in the late 90s was, you know, people were struggling to find galaxies much beyond redshift 2 or 3. Here was the possibility where we might actually see, you know, if there were luminous galaxies at high redshift, the sun millimeter would be where to find them. Obviously we speed up so the grey gets accelerates as we move on. So this is, we're going to look next look at um, the finding charts. And these, I have spent we spent hundreds of nights on telescopes um, to get these maps. And all that I'm interested in doing is to pick the sources out of them and then throw the maps away. Um, so it really is quite depressing. But anyway, you get to show these not particularly attractive pictures uh, of three patches of sky. I've chosen these three. Well, these two in particular um, are what most of the Alma results I will be showing you are coming from. So the first one of these it's a Laboka survey of the extended Chandra deep, deep field south. Uh, you don't need to know where that is, but it's well placed for Alma. Um, and it's a, a well studied cosmological field. It's got about a quarter of a square degree in size. And this Laboka map that Axel Weiss and Fabian and myself published back in 2009 gets to about a Milijansky. And as I told you a, a moment ago, if you can survey those sorts of depths, <laughs> then you should be able to find these ultra luminous sources right out to very high regions. The other map that we will be looking at is uh, this UKIDS ultra deep survey, UDS is, is what 
this. This is a bigger field. It's about four times larger than the, the scuba map, the, the local map of the CDFS. Um, it's about. It's a little deeper than this uh, because it's larger. It gives us a bigger sample. Uh, it's also both of these are well placed for observing with Alma, and that's why they were the focus of these surveys. And the one in the background is something that's an ongoing project, which is why it's grayed out here, uh, is to take a map of the whole of the, the cosmos field with Scooby 2. And that's something that well, we're currently we've got an interim version of that map that will probably be published early next year. Now, the fundamental reason why we need these maps is that the surface density of these sources uh, in these fields, as you saw from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image I showed you earlier, that patch of sky only had one of these objects in it. And so you need a big survey uh, to get large samples. And importantly, if you're going to try to study these with an interferometer, the interferometers don't have the wide field of view that these bolometer cameras on single dish telescopes have. They have very, very narrow fields of view. And so if you were trying to find these sources by chance in, with Alma, you'd have to take 100 pictures with Alma to find one of them. Whereas with a single dish telescope, I could build up a sample of 100 or 1,000 sources in a few tens of nights or hundreds of hours, I guess. Um, so that's fundamentally why we, we start this process with these sudden meter surveys. This was the state of the art uh, before Alma came on. The, those maps, I told you, they're, you know, they're not terribly attractive. Uh, they provide limited information content because they're low resolution. Uh, and so one of the few things that people managed to work out from them is what the counts were of sources. So this is differential number counts of sources as a function of apparent flux. Um, and what you see is you know, there are data sets taking over 15 years or something, 50, you know, a decade and a half, um, before we managed to get decent interferometer to work with. Uh, and these counts rise very steeply. They go as flux to the minus 3 the differential counts. So they, they rise from very low surface densities at the right end, around 10 millijanskis. These are things which have staff, a fat flux corresponds roughly to a star formation rate of about a thousand solar masses a year, so that's a really intense star burst. Um, and they increase, they, the counts are very steep down to the confusion limit, and this is the point where the resolution of the map is so poor that the sources become blended and you're unable to detect them individually. And there's very little range in flux between, you know, the point where you find, start to find one object for the, the map uh, and the point where you hit this confusion limit. There's only a factor of you know, 10 in flux. In the very narrow range in, uh, uh, to deal with. Now the key thing is, you know, these, the counts are steep, so that says that the evolution is likely to be fast, um, but what is you know, responsible for these fast evolution? And this is, this is really going back, this is historical work. Um, this was the first source we ever found. Uh, and I'm showing it to you because it's an example of how these are not normal sources. Um, this is the original map, 850 micro map that we took um, back in 1997. It's of a cluster of galaxies, so we were trying to exploit gravitational lensing to improve the sensitivity because we were really on the hairy edge of what we could do. And luckily we found one very bright source in that map, which actually corresponds to this sort of train wreck down here. Uh, and this image over here is, because this is a gravitational lens, we've had to demagnify the source to see what it would look like in, in the source plane. This is what this system appears to look like uh, in, in, if you actually took the lens away. And the key thing here is, you know, we got lucky with the first source. Um, we could identify it relatively easily. We could get a redshift for it from a 4 meter class telescope um, that put it at very high, relatively high redshifts for back in you know, 1997, redshift 2.8 was a, a not embarrassing redshift to find the galaxy at. Um, interestingly, it has, it, we knew originally it had one Q, uh, uh, broad out ultra line QSO in it. Uh, subsequent studies have shown that in fact there's another, there's a power law AGM up here, 
Uh, neither of these two black holes, the creating black holes, actually corresponds to the centre of mass of this system. That is hidden in here. This is where the bulk of the gas, the bulk of mass in this system, is situated. So this looks like it's a three-way merger. It is about as far from what I would assume you know, most of us would think of as a normal galaxy as it's possible to get. Um, so this was a good hint that uh, this class of objects was you know, abnormal in some way. Now the difficulty I alluded to right at the start with the, the video that was showing you the zoom in was that the hard part with the study of this, these class of objects was trying to track down exactly which was the submillimeter source. So here is the typical patch of sky, the error circle is comes from our submillimeter map, it says that the source responsible for the emission you can see in the map is somewhere in the circle, probably, and you can see that there are the choice of 20 or so galaxies that you can choose that could be that, the source of that emission. And you need to track down which of these it is, or if it is in fact none of them, and is something you can't see. So the way that people were used, did this was that they tried to use other wave bands where there was higher spatial resolution uh, data available as a proxy to try to identify the far infrared luminous source. So you can't find it from the peak of the emission, but because there are correlations between the radio emission and the mid-infrared and the total luminosity of these sources, you could use these as, as indicators <coughs> Now, if you find a radio source within this, this circle, then it's likely to be the, the submillimeter of far infrared bright source. Now, the difficulty with that is that while the, the far infrared, the submillimeter has this very nice K correction that allows you to see out to high redshifts, that's not true in the radio or the mid infrared. So you've effectively thrown away the, the possibility of finding high redshift sources by doing this. You will find all of the redshift 1 and 2 counterparts probably, uh, but you won't find the redshift 3, 4, 5 things. So this was a real restriction and the key you know, to get around this, which would be taken 25 minutes to get to, uh, is <coughs> you know, ALMA. So here are, you're going to see three data sets uh, which come from ALMA. This one was the first one that we got. This is a follow-up with ALMA of all the sources in that remote survey of the CPFS region. And this was in cycle zero, so this is uh, 2012, 2013, I guess we got the data. Um, and you can see that the data quality is what could politely be called variable. Um, there are maps, you know, which perhaps Alma wouldn't like you to publish. Uh, there are beams in here, I don't think we have the beam shapes, um, they're, they're not very visible. There are source maps in here that have banana shaped beams. But, you know, this was Alma right at the start, 16 issues. Uh, it was hard work uh, for them to get the array to work. And so they managed to get 88, about two thirds or three quarters of this survey done with high quality maps. And by high quality, this is the RMS, so this is a factor of two or three deeper than our single dish maps. But critically, the beam is now, instead of being 15 or 25 arc seconds, it's one or two arc seconds in size. And so that means that the uncertainty with being able to locate the counterparts is much, much lower than now that you have Alma. So this is a, now we're moving to cycle one. This is a, a pilot project um, taken on the other survey, that scuba two survey of the UBS field. Um, now Alma's got more like 35 or 40 dishes. Um, they've got the hand of how to operate it, and so you'll see all you know, the data quality for these is now beautiful. The maps are a factor of two deeper than the ones I showed you a moment ago. And importantly, the beam is now fi even finer. This is now approaching HST resolution, but taking the far, taking maps of the far infrared uh, of the galaxy is not very ultraviolet. And so this is the current survey, state of the survey uh, in that GPS uh, field. There are 700 millimeter sources that we're observing, and in cycle three and cycle four, they've done, or well, cycle three so far, they've done about two thirds of that. 
Um, this is about half of the, the total. Uh, we, we're struggling at this point to make them visible, I guess I could make a movie or something, but you, know, you can see there's red dots in all of these maps, for the most part. Some of them you can find, you can see no little red dot. So this is now, um, you know, factors of well, this level, 10 times higher resolution than the, the, the ALMA survey I showed you at the start, and, and more like 100 times better than the single dish resolution, uh, and at depths that are you know, sufficient to detect uh, even faint counterparts to these sources. So the key thing, uh, well one of the first things we've discovered is that actually a lot of the counterparts we thought we'd identified in the past uh, were wrong. So we, well, we've been using this mid-infrared and radio proxy techniques to try to identify the sources. Um, well, we found this is the, this sample. This is the Laboka survey, the ECDFS. About 60% of the submillimeter sources had a radio and infrared counterpart, um, but actually those turned out to only be about 80% reliable. So once you factor that in, that in, those incorrect IDs in, uh, the radio and infrared surveys that we've spent the last 15, 20 years doing. We're actually only recovering about half of the IDs, uh, the correct IDs. So, you know, half of the sources were unidentified in those maps. <coughs> and the other striking thing, one of the reasons that we had such a low recovery rate was actually because there are typically many, <coughs> many more than one submillimeter source turning up in these maps. You see, these are ordered in flux. Uh, and you can see the brightest source in this field actually comprises three submillimeter sources when you take an image of it with alpha. You know, the next one's two. This one is one, but it has other components that are just outside the primary beam. So this this was, I think, somewhat was surprising uh, that there was such a high rate of, of uh, multiple components in these. And that, you know, that's changed things. That horrible plot I showed you of the, the number counts has got simpler because we've been able to throw away 15 years of work uh, and just focus on the, the interferometric counts now. Uh, and so that's what you see here, the filled symbols. This is the integral of the integrated number counts versus submillimeter flux. Uh, from a couple of the submillimeter surveys, this is the CDFS one. This one here is this UDS survey. Uh, and you can see that the, the counts have actually got steeper because of this multiplicity. The brightest sources aren't as bright as we thought because most of the fraction of flux is coming from companions. And so when you take that into consideration, what you find is you've got more faint sources and fewer bright sources, and the counts have actually got a little bit steeper. And in fact, there was evidence from the first survey that it might go over a cliff that there was finding nothing brighter than about 10 solar masses a year. We're finding a few sources now at those sorts of limits, but far lower than we thought uh, from the single dish surveys. And that limit corresponds to this 1,000 solar masses a year of star formation. So this is said, well, there are very, we thought originally that there were quite a large volume density, a reasonable volume density of these very, very extreme sources. Now Alma has shown us that that's not the case that the star formation is spread in these very extreme systems across several components. And it's not immediately obvious that those components are in the same halo, that they're actually related to each other. Okay? Are they merging components of individual galaxies that are all running into each other? Um, are they at very different redshifts? Because we've got this sensitivity over a very wide redshift range. Projections are not, you know, not zero chance. So um, the key thing though, I think, from my perspective, is you can work out the number density of these secondary components, these fake submillimeter sources, and you discover that their rate, the rate you're finding about them, is about 80 times higher than you would expect just by random chance. And 80 is a big number. Um, and so I think that this is some indication that actually these systems are associated, these multiple components. You know, that is such a high over density that it 
it's argued that they're very likely to be physically associated, they're telling you that these systems are undergoing mergers and that's the reason uh, you're picking them out. This is just uh, very early results from the very large survey, the cycle 3 4. Uh, effectively, it's, it's supporting our earlier pilot observations of the work from UCDFS. You find multiplicity, these are a bunch of bright sources, these are a bunch of faint sources. Um, you're seeing lots of multiple components in the same. Uh, so, again, a very high rate of these secondary sources in the maps. Um, the other thing that I didn't really stress earlier is, and this was embarrassing to start with, is that you know, up to about 10% of these armor maps doesn't have, don't have any sources in them at all. Um, and if you persuaded Alma's TAC to give you valuable Alma time to uh, you know, identify high range of sources and you went back and told them that these sort, you know, this is the sort of map you were finding, there's nothing in it, um, you might get a little embarrassed. Um, so we were very worried about this. We thought we, would, you know, we, thought we had the coordinates wrong, we thought we had the more spurious sources in our single dish maps than we'd estimated, we thought they were down at the rate of about 1% spurious, not 10%. Um, so, you know, this was embarrassing. However, when we dug a little deeper, you actually find that there's something very interesting going on. Um, so, this is what happens if you take those blank maps. So, these are images, uh, patches of the sky, where a single dish telescope says there's a sub millimeter source. You point an armor at it, long enough to be able to detect something that you know, should be bright of the expected brightness, and you see nothing at all with that. So what's the problem? Well, you can go to Herschel and look at the far infrared properties of these patches of sky. And so these are the stacked. So we're taking the Herschel far infrared spy maps of this patch of sky, and you stack these blank maps. There are you know, tens, a few tens of them. You stack the, the Herschel emission, and you find that indeed Spire also sees emission of those, plate, those positions in the sky. So there is a far infrared bright source in the, the, at those places. If you then look at the properties of the, um, the galaxies in those patches of sky, this is a redshift distribution. And what I'm plotting here in green is you can ask if I have a class of objects, or if I have an average of uh, Brandon's sight line, what, was the, what distribution of galaxies do I expect to see? You see, expect to see this black, solid white line, this solid histogram. If you look at the, in these patches of skies, you actually see an excess number of galaxies at redshifts between two and three in these regions. So there are more galaxies of redshift two and three than you expect from these regions. So that is unusual. That's exactly the same behaviour uh, that you will see in the moment that we see for the, the class of, uh, of submillimeter sources where we can actually get redshift. So this indication of this is that actually there is uh, submillimeter flux. It's spread across many little galaxies in these regions. You can't detect it without them because our maps were quite sensitive enough, but on average it's there, there is, there is an issue. Okay, so using these, these very precise armor maps, we can say, now really tell you what the properties are of this class of uh, source. Okay, instead of having to only see the 50% of them that are bright and radial within infrared, we can now locate all of them, pretty much all of them. And these are the distributions in terms of optical brightness, near infrared, okay, into mid infrared, and radio, in terms of the different samples. This is a, the Laboca survey, the CDFS, and this pilot in the UBS survey. And what you find is that the median magnitudes for these galaxies are very, very faint. Okay, they are far better than the UV populations that people are using or trying to, to track the star formation history with. These are very faint sources, and in fact there are, there are about 20% of them that are almost undetected. And either all of the, all the optical near infrared or in very few of the near infrared bands. So these are very, very galaxies, very, very faint. You can try to 
use um, strike you want, you've got the brightness of these sources, you want to know what the redshifts are. You have the possibility of surveying these objects out to very high redshifts. Um, you know, what's, can we confirm that we're finding sources out to redshifts 6, 7, and 8? Well, the answer is we could, well, we might be able to, but we can't. Uh, and the difficulty is because the redshifts that we're relying on are pretty much you know, dependent on having optical emission because we're still having to use optical traces. So, metric redshifts, spectroscopic redshifts all rely on, on having uh, UV emission effectively detectable, and these are very dusty, very red sources. Nevertheless, you can try, you know, as hard as you can, to use photometric redshifts to try to derive fit the SEDs and determine uh, likely redshifts for these class of objects. And you find that you know, they have typical medium redshifts around two, two and a half degrees, which is what the typical um, medium redshift for these populations. We do have these very optically faint or near infrared faint sources. So these are uh, now we're doing the stacking to try to improve the quality of the spectral energy distribution to try to give us more information about the light redshifts. These are this is the stack of the 10% of sources that are only detectable in either not detected in any photometric band or only detected in one. Here are the ones that are detected in two or three bands. You see that they can be well fit by spectral energy distribution like bulk of the population, but at somewhat higher redshifts, not 2.5, 2.7, this is now 3.5 or 3. So these faint optically blank objects are the ones that are you know, most likely to retain the redshifts. And in fact, there's some good confirmation of that um, from the fact that Alma not only is as an image, a continuum image of the sky, but that data is actually a cube. It gives you a spectral cube covering around seven or eight gigahertz of bandwidth. And if you have a, a, a emission line from your source, and there are emission lines we expect to see at certain ranges, then the fact that you have a cube of data means that you can search for that emission line. And the most prom promising line to search for for to identify high redshift sources is this uh, carbon plus carbon 2 line of 157 microns. And here are two, by, by chance, in our maps, two of these sources just happen to show emission line within the 8 gigahertz of the band pass. And these correspond to redshift 4.4. So these two sources are very high redshift examples. One of them is one of these is this one, that's right, it's one of these sources which is undetected in the optical. You only just about detect it with IRAC, with spits or IRAC, and you see it in the far infrared. So this is one of these class of optically fake, optically blank sources. Uh, and the reason is that this one is a high register, high register, high register, high register, high register, high Max is going to tell you that we don't know what the masses are, so that's it. <laughs> Takeaway line. Um, this is, you know, there are, this is two slides and two pictures in um, the one of the key quality capabilities of ARMA is the opportunity to do very high resolution images. So, that's I've shown you today, you know, one arc second, one three arc second. Getting to point one half second to now approach the cover space or face the cover space telescope resolution. So these are sub millimeter maps from a cycle three program that Jackie Hodge uh, led um, of a subset of the brighter sub millimeter sources from the, the CDFS. And you can see these, these sources are resolved. And the striking thing to me, at least, when I saw this was that these just look like spiral galaxies, spiral galaxies, like disks. You know, they're, they're really disky. And this wasn't what we were expecting at all. You know. um, but the paradigm for this class of objects, or for high redshift objects, at the moment has been lots of clumps. You know, uh, friends in Munich love their clumps, and so clumps are everything. And 
And so to come and find nice, you know, apparently regular disks, this is dust and therefore probably cold gas, in nice regular disks in these systems was very surprising. What's even more surprising is when you compare them to the HST morphologies of the same objects. So this is a, these are images now made from optical and near infrared from HST, and the red channel is the alma data. And what you will see is that the red blobs only appear right in the middle. These disks are very small, relatively small, they're two or three kiloparsecs apart. The galaxies that scale like the ionized gas that you can see here is 10, 10 kiloparsecs across. But these very intense starbursts are only happening in very very sensitive these systems. And so I think naively we'd expect to see these, these disks being clumpy because one well, could see these images of clumpy you know, clumps that allegedly are the big star forming clumps that are in these galaxies that are driving their evolution. Well they're not because actually the bulk of 95, 99 percent of the star formation in these systems is going on in this patch of dense gas dense dust right in the middle. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with these points. And that seems to be the fairly smooth disk. And here I just focus on this slide. This is this is analyzing the data to see what the start formation rate has to be on the disks and they reach very high start formation rate density much higher than local animals. The thing I want to just end on over here our maps of these now, these sources now taken at 30 milli arc second resolution, however, so that's about 200 parsec resolution. These are redshift four of galaxies. And if you look at these and you go, wow, you know, isn't this clumpy? You know, how do you found those dust clumps that you know, Reinhardt was talking about us about all this time? We have found this. Well, you should always doubt. So um, here at the bottom are uh, these are the set of the, the, point 50, the 150 milli arc second maps. And this is one of those 30 milli arc second maps. And the bottom of this are just simulations of what you would get if you made if you gave used the smooth disk with the properties that we think these sources have, and you observed it with Alma in the way that we've observed these sources at the signal to normal. And what you see is that while these were smooth disks, they don't look smooth anymore. Especially once you get to 30, you know, 30 milli arc second resolution, at least signal to noise is that we've got at these resolutions, the smooth things break up and they break up into apparent clumps. But none of these clumps are significant. And so the takeaway is not, you know, it's a bit of an anticlimax, I appreciate it, but the takeaway result is actually a negative. At least at the present time, um, the evidence we have of clumpy star formation in these systems seems to be not statistically robust, even though so much of it you, know, you can reproduce it um, with just smooth disks. And so we are still in a situation where we're trying to understand you know, whether or not we can, any of these clumps that you can see are robust, or at the present moment, we think the answer is no. So uh, here are the conclusions to let them get away. Um, we've learned quite a lot over the last three or four years with our work about these high-rated of the sources, these very intense start-forming 
so this is where we're currently, our interpretation is currently Um, I wonder about uh, the, the smooth disk structure you have shown uh, for these galaxies. And at the beginning, I understood you that um, these high star formation rates come from merger events. And um, out of these uh, smooth images, um, I wonder how could it be that there's not an ongoing merger event visible in these images? or is there any other process that could trigger these high star formation rates? Right. So, so very good question. Uh, not the other two uh, <laughs> so the, the key here is what the time scale is for forming that gas is. So we think that these subnumbers and starbursts can't last for very long. They're very high star formation rates, that they have reasonable gas supplies, but they can't last that long. However, we think that it's long enough for, for the gas in the merging system to actually get itself down into a disk configuration. So it's, it's difficult. You're looking at the 
time scale is comparable, but it's not impossible to have a merger where the gas material goes into the, the common potential well and can form a disk on the time scale of a few ten millions to tens of millions of years. And so you can actually get locally, if you look at there are examples of local merger systems where you see the two nuclei of the galaxy still there, but in the middle is a disk of gas that's come from both of them that is where all the star formation is going on. And that's the sort of you know, the, the basic model that we think we're looking at here is that they have formed stable gas disks out of the moon. Any more questions? A quick question. You mentioned that some of these galaxies may be at very high resolution. What are the prospects of actually remaining on that sun very high resolution? Something that is very much the case. The one way you say this is that they should have done in your service. Yes, there are wretched seven, eight sources. They are there. They are some of the hardest ones to track down. So at the moment, we have half of the data. Um, on scanning this, we see two lines I showed you, the 158 micron line. Um, that was just in a little packet from part of the waveband. If you use ALMA, you can actually see the actual range. And so we have a survey that's trying to search in the blank sources between redshift three and a half and six and a half, I think. Um, so far, that's not turned up anything at six and a half. My gut feeling is, other than your wind stars, there, there are very few mass, really massive galaxies out of Redshift 6, 7. Um, yeah, Redshift 6, 7. At least in the circumstances.